Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Greetings, everyone. I am Pamela Tang, president of Mataka. Joining me from the Mataka board is your moderator for today's webinar, Marilee Snepomechi. This is a forum for us to share the timely conversations around today's built environment through the lens of Course 4 alumni. MIT's Department of Architecture is the oldest program in the nation and has continually evolved over its more than 150 years of history to prepare our graduates for a changing world. Intrinsic to our design education is the cognitive mastery of the creative design processes nurtured by a culture of experimentation and the collective aspiration to build a better world. Here at MIT, students are challenged to expand the discipline. Increasingly, our graduates can be found making waves across industry sectors, solving problems where they must bring creativity and innovation to bear through their understanding of building and making. What are our youngest Course 4 alumni doing today? We're very excited to have four talented m teners Anna Vargas, Catherine Winfield, Matt Bunza, and Sunny Lau, here to share their work and join Marilise in a conversation on the value and versatility of their education and how it applies to shaping a career in the US and abroad in the context of all that is going on in our world. I want to especially welcome our students and young graduates in the audience. Our panel today represents a wealth of timely experience and relatable perspectives. I encourage you to reach out with your questions. Without further delay, let's start. Shall we, Marilise? Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third Metarka webinar. And thank you, Pamela, for the nice introduction. My name is Marilise Nepomechi. I am a proud MIT alum and a member of the board of directors of the MIT Architecture Alumni Association. I'm an architect, I'm a professor of architecture in Miami, Florida, as well as an academic administrator. I'm an associate dean of faculty and programs at Florida International University in Miami. I'm past president of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, current president of the National Architectural Accrediting Board, NAAB, and co-director and co-reporter of the Education Commission and UNESCO UIA Validation Council at the International Union of Architects. I hope to bring the dual perspectives of practice and education to our conversation today. And that conversation will be an exceptional one, I have no doubt. In a departure from the two previous iterations of Metarka webinars, we've convened the discussion with four absolutely inspiring m -teners. These are alums who are in the very first decade of forging careers after graduation from the Institute. As I'm sure you know, as and as we will all see today, Course 4 alumni are active in many professions and industries. We are, among many, many other things, architects, designers, builders, educators, innovators, and community activists. We will find examples of all of these things in the presentations today. Although their compelling stories and their presentations will speak to all of us who admire the work of our MIT classmates, today we've asked Anna, Catherine, Matthew, and Sunny to share their work and experiences with a particular view to addressing the questions and concerns of recent graduates and current students who are preparing to enter the world of work and looking for meaningful and productive ways of doing that. Let me introduce them really briefly and we will get underway. Our first speaker is Anna Vargas, SMARS um, of 2014. She's an architect and urban designer based in Caracas. 
She has lived and worked in Italy, India, and the US, as well as her homeland of Venezuela. She obtained her degree in architecture from the UCV and her master's from MIT. She's founder and director of Trasando Espacios, a non-for-profit organization focused on transforming public spaces. And she'll talk about that today. She also has an award-winning professional practice, which focuses on projects related to architecture with social impact and participatory urban design. Our second speaker is Catherine Winfield, MR13, and one of three. Um, alumni from the, um, from the class of 2013. She says that tackling big problems that matter is what gets her out of bed in the morning. Catherine focuses um, on leading creative teams that help people. At present, she leads a powerful, talented team of designers, researchers, and content strategists at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, she's worked for Foundation Medicine, as well as the startup Qantas, and she'll talk about that in a moment. Our third presenter, also in Mark 13, is Matthew Bunza. He's a designer and educator dedicated to the creation of meaningful environments and unique spatial experiences. He co-founded Metamo, a process-driven design practice working at the intersection of building, cities, landscapes, and ecologies, and as an international platform for bridging oppositions across practice, theory, poetics, and pragmatics, East and West, and high end and high impact. Our final presenter is Sunny Lau. Sunny is Director of Smart City Research and Industry Collaborations, the MIT Hong Kong Innovation Mode. She graduated with a BA from the University of California, Berkeley, and the MARC, a certificate in urban design from MIT. She's worked for um, Morphosis, she's worked for MVRDV, um, and currently works um, on smart city planning, inclusive innovation for communities, urban master planning, urban mobility, and smart infrastructure. We look forward to these great presentations. Anna, please start us off. Hi, thank you for the introduction. And it's an honor to be here sharing the work that we're doing in Venezuela. Um, and uh, I'll share my screen right now to the end. So today I wanna to tell you a series of stories about how I think architecture can and has transformed lives, my life included. And I think that's possible with participatory design, which means putting people at the center of design processes. Uh, but before I got there, I really need to briefly tell you about why I went to MIT and which were the questions that had arisen in my life that really needed to find answers. Although I think I still am looking for some answers. But I went to MIT um, gro having grown up in Venezuela, a country of citizens, 94% of our population lives in cities. And those cities um, like Caracas, um, have a huge issue. They grew very fast. And because of that, one out of two people live in informal settlements, which, is, which means that they don't enjoy the great things about cities, basic services, great accessibility, public spaces, and all those great things. So I was really looking into answers of how could urban design improve those conditions. And I realized that some people, when they look in the world at these kind of places, they only see this picture. And of course, feel overwhelmed and really don't know how to go about it, right? But I usually like to look for this kind of beauty, which to me represents something more deep, represents a local identity, represents hard work, and represents a lot of things that can be all put together to make a difference in this kind of place. So I ended up going to MIT and developing a thesis that was about um, a research that I did in India, thanks to a Tata fellowship that I had at the time and a MISI experience also. And it was based on giving tools basically to children so that they could use all their abilities and that identity and all those great things to actually think how they could transform their public spaces. But first they needed to observe and analyze their community to raise questions on, how, on what needed to be changed and how it could be changed and then imagine what could be done to actually make it a reality, take some risks and see how 
you know, those spaces could be transformed. So after two years at MIT, I graduated uh, with this thesis um, on my hand, this method, and I had to take one of the greatest risks I've taken in my life. I decided to go back to my country, Venezuela, in spite of a very hard situation. My friends were fleeing the country and I was kind of running on the other way, right? And I went back and I joined academia. I did consultancy. I did a lot of things, but I decided to take further my method and actually keep on working it. So after six years, we are now an NGO based in Venezuela that has been in 34 communities and done more than 4,000 square meters of public spaces transformed in, in all these communities. But moreover, what has been really amazing is the 800 kids that have been part of these processes, but they're only kids, but adults, their parents, their friends that have gotten involved in these transformation processes and of public space, but in the end have transformed themselves. So I want to just share a few of those stories today very briefly because we have little time. Uh, but so that you remember the central things that make participatory design successful. So the first thing, it's about you need to enlighten people about design abilities, design tools so that they can make the most out of these processes. And this is the story of Del Melis, that little girl right there. She was a creative, talented girl. But when she received all the tools that we gave her through a workshop, a one week intensive workshop in school to her and her friends, they actually made this model, which represents the park that they needed for their school. And it has a huge boat that represents uh, the boats that take the cocoa of the region to make the finest chocolate in the world. So they made this model. And after eight months, they worked together with their parents and actually built it as a park for the school. It's not only that Dalmelis was able to use these tools to make a reality, an idea, but also they were able to take care of it. After two weeks, I asked the principal about how is it working? And she tells me, you know, the sixth graders have become the gardens of the park. They are the ones in charge of the rest of the school that are 400 kids, not to ruin anything in the park because they own the park. They feel like they, they've done it. They, they, it was their idea. They build it and they have to take care of it. So that takes me to another thing of this kind of process is for that actual design to be like that, you have to let go of your architectural ego. For me, that has been a process of transformation. You see, we are used to magazines and buildings that are like art pieces signed by this architect. And for me, it has to be, okay, it's not about me actually. It's not about me telling the kids what they should do according to what I would like, but it's actually giving them the tools so that they can share their ideas. So you get all these pictures that are not my portfolio at all, not even the organization's portfolio. It's the work of more than 20 different architects that have worked as volunteers or, or as part of the organization, around 800 kids and many, many adults that have provided ideas and things to make this a collective authorship, a collective um, architecture. So then there are three amazing results of this kind of processes that I want to end up sharing with you. One is integrating different parts of society, different people into one project for the common good. This is a big square. The kids designed three spaces, one for each age group. It took us more than a year to build it. But during the building process, everyone got involved, no matter their age, little, little kids, older adults. And this is the result. But one of the people that really, really transformed me and, and really was an example is Evelyn right there. She's the leader of the neighbors next to the square. And she organized the women around to cook for six weeks every day from Monday to Saturday voluntarily for the people who were building the square. And in the meantime, they were all supervising and making sure that everything was built according to the drawings and according to their plan. So today they also own in a way this square and sustain it and make sure that it is always with the flowers blooming and things going well on it. Uh, so in a way it's an example of a strengthening the local identity and enhancing that sense of belonging in people. And that's the story of Javier too. He's the boy who was stuttering. He couldn't, he was really shy. He couldn't speak until he had to speak about the story of transformation of a community house in his community, in his, in his neighborhood. Uh, that's a story of Nate Davison too, who kind of took care of this abandoned house for 20 years that was really damaged after a big flooding. 
And when we bring in the kids to say, what shall we do to help Davison? They design this costume that is a typical tradition um, with these shapes and colors. And they turn this facade into a, a facade that represents the identity. A year later, we go again, we ask a girl who has not been in this workshop to make a drawing of their community with the things that represent the identity. And there you see in the bottom lower part, the house as part of the identity of that community. So Javier is proud of this. He, he goes you know, about his shyness to speak about it. And so does other people that recognize in it their identity and something that is meaningful for them. And what you might have already seen in all these people, Del Melis, Evelyn, Javier, is that they are empowered and empowerment gives for sustainable transformation. So I'll just finish with Raul. This is story. Um, he is a man, a self-made man. He, he really um, had to fix some leaks on the roof, but couldn't get to it until we went and told him, you know, we really need to make your house better for a better quality of life. They were cooking inside a closet with no ventilation, extremely dangerous. They were all living in one room of the house. So we made a participatory project with the kids that are teenagers more than kids, and they designed a new project for the house. They built it over six months, even during COVID, they all worked, not only them, but they invited their younger neighbors to be part of this process. They built a table to eat together as a family, which was something they had never done. They didn't have a table in the house, not one. And I love this. He and his, and his son designed this pattern to kind of dress the house with something that he feels like represents him and the way he has transcended his limitations and his, and his problems to become a family man, taking care of his two younger kids. So this is the house, these are the results. In the end, it's three things, right? Integrating community, strengthening their identity to build that sense of belonging and empowerment. And just to finish, uh, COVID has been hard for us, like for everyone, but it also, it also has been a huge opportunity. In January, we trained 10 new teachers. It was the first time that we decided to scale and train at the same time, 10 new teachers for our processes. And thanks to that, at this moment, we're teaching a workshop for 79 children in one of the most complex and dangerous slums in Caracas called Petare. And this is something that makes me extremely happy to see how all these people have learned their method and I are teaching these kids. And the same thing goes to, you know, from being centralized to being localized. This is a school we want to build in a community in a very remote village. And it's very hard to take people now from the capital who have been trained to go all the way there. But we did an online training. We started it two months ago. We're about to finish. And Noelia right there on the top who's a teacher in the area, has learned the tools and will now be leading this workshop. With, so we are strengthening the local people so that they can have the tools and learn and teach others. So can we transform lives through architecture? I think I've told you enough stories. It's my story, it's their story, it's our story. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, Catherine, can you please share your work? Absolutely. Let me share my screen. Um, perfect. So thank you for um, uh, Thank you for inviting me today. It was a pleasure getting to prepare for this presentation. Um, and Anna, thank you for that wonderful uh, presentation of your work. There's a lot of overlap between our work and I'm excited to, to maybe connect on that after this talk. So in preparation for today's talk, um, I think that I represent, I was reflecting on the fact that I think that I represent a somewhat non-traditional path for architecture students. And Matthew Bunza, who's presenting a little bit later um, in today's talk, had posted on Facebook some exciting updates about us uh, giving this talk today. And there was a hilarious post that I wanted to share with you all from a classmate who was talking about what does it mean to still be in the architectural profession? And so I think my journey is a little bit uh, different and I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what I would classify myself any as anymore. But if you have any thoughts at the end of this talk, I'd love to hear what kind of bucket you might put me in. So as a means of introduction, I wanna talk a little bit about my journey since I've left MIT and since I've presented my thesis shown here. 
Um, following graduation, I moved to San Francisco. I was connected through the Alumni Association with a um, startup in San Francisco called Movie. They were a competitor to Vine, if anybody remembers them. And I was only there for 90 days. They um, were, their exit strategy was acquisition. And when Vine was acquired by Twitter, they were not acquired by Facebook. And so I was then left thinking about what it means to live in San Francisco and as a recent graduate, how to apply my skills. I then had an opportunity to actually come back to Boston and um, get a role in a lab that I worked at as a student, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and in thinking about how to sustain a research lab at MIT through sponsorship, it looks a lot like sales and account management in the corporate world. And so I was able to gain a lot of uh, really useful skills from that role. Um, I then met two other MIT alumni who uh, were starting this um, a startup called Qantas. They were building a uh, optical sensor at the wrist that measures pulse transit time, pulse transit time being a, a derivative of blood pressure. One was a Sloney and one was an um, uh, electrical engineering uh, graduate. And so we, uh, I came in early in this company and worked on um, industrial design, manufacturing, uh, digital experience. Um, that uh, we then uh, I then transitioned into Foundation Medicine, which is an oncology genomics company. Um, that was my first uh, senior leadership position there. Um, and I learned so much about working in a corporate environment, um, but built some real leadership chops. And then finally moved back to San Francisco two years ago, where um, I now lead design for the education initiative at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, CZI. Um, I also, as you'll see throughout the presentation, always have my hands in many pots. So um, my partner and I just recently launched actually an online home goods store um, and the sales go back to our community here in Oakland. So let's talk about CZI, um, which I think is the most exciting part of my journey and probably the most unusual part for an architecture student. So CZI was founded by Mark and Priscilla um, approximately five or six years ago with the intent of committing uh, somewhere like 98 or 99% of their um, wealth towards improving um, globally issues like education, science, justice, and opportunity. Um, Priscilla leads the majority of the day-to-day -day work there. She's a pediatrician. Uh, while Mark was building Facebook, um, she was getting her medical degree and then she opened a school called the primary school uh, that's in the peninsula in the Bay Area. And so as an educator, as a second generation immigrant, and as a pediatrician, she's uniquely suited to lead the initiative across these three areas. Um, when I first started, I was uh, much more, we were a smaller organization, as you saw in that photo of the whole org, and I was working more collaboratively across. We've since um, grown significantly and I've really focused my time in education. So in the education initiative, we have four key bodies of work. Our policy and advocacy and systems, which works with policymakers around education in the US, research to practice, which takes uh, research findings from the field and applies it into educational practice, similar to what you would think of as a clinical trial in the medical space. And then two technology uh, products, Summit Learning Program and Along. Um, my team right now is about 35 product designers, researchers, content strategists, systems designers. This is a photo of some of us pre-pandemic. Um, a lot of our work looks similar in process to what Anna just presented in terms of inclusive design, working with educators, working with students to develop the technology products that I was just mentioning. So um, the Summit Learning Program has been around for the longest. It's been around for pretty much the, since the inception of CZI, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about Along today, which is a um, new product that we have just released as of last week actually, um, to help uh, support distance learning and education as a result of COVID. Um, not to be remiss, I think it is important to note that Summit is a really huge program. Um, it's 80,000 students, 4,000 teachers, about 400 schools in the US. But because Along is such an exciting thing um, that we just came out with, and it's very timely for our COVID response, I did want to play a short video that I think really highlights well uh, what Along is about. We can all remember a teacher who stood out, who made a difference, someone you could talk to, someone who cared, who understood the challenges you faced and believed in you. You chat in the hallway between classes or grab a few minutes after class. Oftentimes, it's those small interactions that can make the biggest difference. 
and the research backs this up. These touch points can help kids build the skills they need to succeed in school, in their career, and in life. COVID-19 may have emptied the hallways, but it hasn't changed the impact a caring teacher can have on a student. That's why we're building ALONG, an interactive video journal that makes it easier for teachers to guide student growth, whether they are back in the classroom or learning remotely. Over the next few months, we will be working with teachers, students, and researchers all around the country to pilot along. Our goal is to create a space where students and teachers can connect and talk about important topics like managing stress and staying motivated. Here's how it will work. First, teachers browse a library of research-backed prompts and practices to spark meaningful conversations with individual students. Students reflect on the topic and share their thoughts through short videos and texts sending their responses directly to their teacher. Teachers can then use their dashboards to view, organize, and respond to student reflections all from one place. In these ever-changing times, teachers need easier ways to engage students and help them thrive. The well-being of our students and their future success depends on it. We don't know when all of our hallways will be full again, but we're excited to continue building along with more educators so that students and teachers everywhere can keep supporting and inspiring one another, wherever they are. So I certainly hope that gave you a sense of the types of things that I work on now. Um, as I mentioned, this is a predominantly a digital product, so not as much related to the built environment, but highly rooted in many of the design processes that we apply um, in studio or in other classes. Um, so when I was reflecting on putting together this presentation and I was thinking about the moment that we were in when we were at MIT and in grad school and what um, I was feeling, I was able to drop in really easily to that experience. And so there's just two reflections and I'll wrap very quickly. Um, there's two reflections that I wanted to leave with you. One, it should feel messy. The trick is making something that feels like this seem like this and it's all edits in post. So I have a story that for time purposes, I don't think I'll get to, but basically, all of the work that you're seeing on the slide happened in the same semester. And I can tell this story very cleanly about this journey of taking classes that built diverse skills, but the reality is it was a complete mess. And this is the type of um, tension that I was feeling, that it was just working really hard, it was long nights and didn't feel like I had a clear path forward, but I can tell that narrative now. Um, and the second one is look for the overlap between your own, uh, the skills that you have now as an architecture student or as a recent alum and fo follow the skills that pay the bills, which sounds like a very perhaps crass way to think about it, but it is true that you have skills that you haven't even thought of. I think of this um, very recent story, if you all know the graphic artist Traff, who made almost $100,000 from just iPhone icons in a week. And I am sure all of the students and recent graduates on this call could very easily make icons like this, but this wouldn't be what you would think of doing as any kind of side hustle as an architecture student, um, or at least it wasn't for me when I was a student. So I think it's important to think about those two types of stories and leverage the platform that you have. Every single one of my opportunities that I had after MIT was a result of the alumni network or talking to recent graduates. So you have a really powerful platform here. Um, and so I really thank you for your time. I, I know we have a Q&A afterwards, so I'm happy to go deeper on anything I had to um, skip through, uh, but you can feel free to look me up and reach out and it might feel like a crazy maze now, but I promise you it will get so much easier and so much clearer very soon. So thank you so much for the time and, and um, I will hand it back over, Pamela, to you. Thank you, Catherine. That was wonderful, as was Anna before you. Matt, if you would share your story with us. Happy to. Thanks everybody for having me. Um, it's so nice to see um, everybody again. And uh, thank you, Matarka and uh, Pam and uh, Moana and Marilise for uh, putting this together. I heard it was also influenced by current students uh, as well, which is kind of awesome. So um, uh, really great to hear the typical MIT proactivity. Um, can you guys see my screen okay? I, I assume. Um, so basically, I'm just going to focus on, um, oops, hold on, pause this. I'm just going to focus on, um, for the most part, my path from MIT to what I'm currently doing now. I'm, I'm uh, seeing you now from Portland, Oregon. I'm 
office in Matamo. We're based in uh, basically half in the U.S., half in Asia. Uh, fundamentally, it all kind of comes back to MIT. Um, to give you a little bit of background, when I went in MIT, um, I had been working for uh, what I consider like high design firms. And I apologize, there's a train literally going right by right now. Um, but I was working at Allied Works in Portland and New York City and uh, Pat Cow Architects in Vancouver, British Columbia. And, you know, I learned a ton there. I really love the, the high design stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I probably did when I came in MIT and do now fit more into the traditional kind of architectural practice, I guess you'd say, uh, compared to other people. Um, but I think my worldview was based half on that high design thing, but also really half on this idea of high impact. Um, I remember specific moments really talking to my brother who was working in, uh, uh, you know, rural Africa for years doing, um, you know, rural international development kind of grassroots work. And so my interest was always to do both, basically. And what I ended up um, going to MIT for was to try to fi figure out how to connect those two kind of disparate dots of the high end and the high impact. Um, I began in 2010 uh, on the MARC uh, advanced two and a half year track. And, you know, I did lots of typical stuff, but I think that the, the main inflection point at MIT for me was probably the Japan workshop, uh, which I assume people in the audience and, and, and you know, certainly tons of alums have, have um, you know, either participated in this or know about it. Um, but it was just, um, I guess the first time that I was able to, I'd say, access a design problem where it could be, um, you know, uh, you could basically put the skills to use of the design skills, but also the, the social, the, the impact, in other words. Um, and I think it was, you know, kind of amazing for me because it was such an, a complex problem. Uh, the issues there were dealing with, um, you know, rural urban, urban migration, disaster resilient design, water and landscape, um, uh, shrinking cities, um, you know, multi-use infrastructure, just everything and everything. Um, and that was really powerful. And I, I, I felt somehow that uh, the other thing that I learned in the Chan workshop was that the issues that you would find across the world, um, even though they were so different in many ways, actually related to um, my own backyard in, in Oregon. Because, you know, we have similar coastal um, towns, we have resilience issues, we're due in the future for an earthquake. And so that was really the, the kind of the inflection point that, um, that I think kind of launched my um, current practice of what I do now. And I ended up actually doing my thesis, um, this, this, these are all images part of my thesis, but I did my thesis on the same thing. Uh, and then when I graduated, I uh, began basically teaching at MIT for a semester um, with uh, Shun Kanda uh, to basically run a workshop um, in studio that was dealing with the same issues. Um, I remember the, the moment the teaching stopped and then we graduated and that sense of the, the void, if you will. And, uh, you know, that void is kind of the thing that, you know, I, in some ways is the impetus, uh, the driver for this, um, you know, this discussion now because the current students are facing even an, an even harder void of, you know, the rough economy, all these unknowns in the world. Um, but I think it was, you know, really like advice from um, actually the MIT professor Andrew Scott uh, was one of them that said, because um, I was dealing with trying to figure out whether I wanted to practice or I wanted to teach. Um, and he said, you should go practice so that you have something to teach about. Um, and with the advice of my, my wonderful wife, Sunny, who's a partner in our office, I, I decided um, basically to make the leap and I decided to start an office. The only way I could actually do anything um, and have the flexibility to work in Asia and in the US and to practice and teach was to basically go out on my own. Um, and so I did. And um, I just wanna kind of share with you um, some of the examples of how uh, even one project can lead to another project and how you can build some of the skills that you've learned and how those things can really cross pollinate each other um, in the same sense that, you know, kind of my mission is to figure out how high design and high impact can cross pollinate each other. Um, so we are, again, based in Portland and Shenzhen, and then we are really working on projects in all these different places, um, kind of all over. So we're a bit spread out, but um, this was our first project, which was just a private residence, again, on the, the more of the high design side up in uh, Saskatchewan in Canada. Um, then we had another project that really came out of that, which was a medical office building. Um, you know, same thing on the on more of the kind of design side. Um, we do 
and have done and continue to do lots of private residences. So this is actually, as far as an MIT connection, this is a, a, a MIT alum uh, who basically lives in the Columbia River Gorge, um, this project. Uh, this is a private residence in um, basically the south of Beijing in China. Um, and so basically, I started building an office in Canada and I rebuilt it in Portland, and we also rebuilt it in Asia. So I've kind of done three startups in a way, even though it's really under the same identity. Um, but I wanted to share basically, you know, one of the, the major um, opportunities we have is we won a competition that is this. The competition was called the Liang Sichuan Cup, uh, where we were basically, um, in effect, um, kind of concretizing this idea of uh, high end and high impact. And we basically built uh, the competition was like for a museum, but we built a museum for outsiders and tourists, which was, you know, an economic engine and whatnot. But it was also um, paired in part with a bunch of local amenities like libraries and classrooms and, and workshop space and, and things like that. So you had this sense of the two things, um, you know, the kind of the, the high design outside world tourists and stuff like that mixing in with the local community. Um, so these are some images of that project. Um, so that one led to another competition that we were invited to, which was basically for an ancestral hall um, in Hebei province in China. Another project that we did recently, um, basically partnering with a um, friend of mine, uh, Sebastian from Unlisted Experiential, was basically a, a more of a kind of a, a, a playful um, project that was a critique of the high design and really trying to use simple, cheap materials and human behavior to affect spatial experiences of, as opposed to, you know, expensive uh, resources. A current project that we actually haven't shown anybody yet, but this is with an MIT alum, uh, Tyler Crane and his company at iFi in San Francisco. We've been working with them uh, developing uh, artificial intelligence retail um, with um, prefabrication pop-ups using shipping containers and whatnot that's uh, basically in um, uh, Wisconsin, New York, um, Poland, um, Amsterdam, uh, Shenzhen, and, and Silicon Valley. Um, so we kind of do the tech as well. Um, shifting more toward recent stuff and, and towards, I think what I'm trying to get at is the intent of really doing more social work. Um, we have been embedding ourselves with nonprofit organizations. And so one is a, one called Living Islands that is basically in Portland and the Marshall Islands. And so we've been working on uh, basically prototype housing and also working on um, a, a kind of a, what you would call a sustainable school that's a doubles as a resilience hub. Um, we've been working on that for probably six years now uh, and anticipate that we're going to work on uh, a lot more. Another one uh, that's a recent project that we started working on about a year ago that again is an example of uh, really, you know, trying to find these opportunities for um, cross pollinating design and also social impact uh, is working with a another nonprofit, the Luluska Foundation, uh, which is basically a Northwest Coast First Nations group in uh, Southwest Washington um, that we're um, really doing, you know, it's, it's not architecture right now, it may culminate in that, but it's really about vision and long-term strategic planning and um, things like that. And then another recent project that we're doing um, is in uh, Shaanxi, China. We're, this is a UNESCO site called Pingyao we're working on um, basically an adaptive reuse design hotel um, in this amazing 350 year old rammed earth residential fortress. Um, and we're uh, basically renovating, uh, you know, 19 courtyards one at a time, turning them into these things. And I show that in conjunction, in conjunction with the previous project because the Northwest Coast clients, some of the ideas that they're actually doing are being implemented in this project uh, as far as education and, and, you know, working with school kids and, and things like that. So, I mean, these things are, literally able to kind of cross pollinate each other, which is really the, the ultimate goal that we're kind of seeking. And this is another one that really comes for full circle. Um, it's talking about how influential the Japan workshop was for me, but we just started working on a um, onsen hotel in uh, Kyushu in South Japan with um, uh, KMDW um, uh, from Tokyo, who were basically friends that we met in the Japan workshop. Um, so it just kind of goes to show how all that stuff um, comes back. Um, I'd love to get into this more in a discussion, but uh, I've kind of tried to call some maybe lessons that we've been taught or that we've learned or figured out um, as far as not just doing the design work, but really 
trying to push the design into the social um, realm. Um, you know, people being the most important thing, this idea of partnerships, not competing, but collaborating, which I really think is something that MIT does, um, you know, over GSD or something like that really well. Um, you know, finding the big problems, being multidisciplinary, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I'd love to, um, you know, as Catherine said, I'd love to go into some of this stuff in further depth, uh, maybe in the discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. That was another exceptional and inspiring um, presentation. Our final presenter is Sunny Lau, last but by no means least. Look forward to hearing from you. Sunny, the floor is yours. And the Thank screen. Thank you. Um, so this is Sunny. Sure. So good afternoon. Um, I'm calling in from uh, Hong Kong. Um, to our fellow MIT alum, I'm glad to be here uh, to share my post-MIT experience and journey uh, to you all. I'm now a licensed architect uh, working at the MIT Hong Kong Innovation Node, which is also based in Hong Kong. So um, during my studies until now, I'm always fascinated by uh, urban theories that picture different possibility of our cities or how technological advancement can impact our cities for tomorrow. And while we are admiring and questioning many of the works of this urbanist, I believe that the more successful ones tends to be capable to combine the arts and science into practice and uh, create timely social impact. Thus, I believe that uh, environmental design profession though now uh, have a lot of um, uh, doubts and uh, questions and challenges uh, ahead. I think with a degree of commitment and care of the, our city and people could bring possibly impact through design excellence and design innovation. So a little bit more about myself, um, why I come to it at this point and I still believe in um, architecture can bring in design uh, innovation. Um, I, since my return to Hong Kong after my graduation immediately, I began, began to practice as an architect, urbanist, and as well as a researcher through learning from different role models and overseas or local. So backtracking a little bit about myself, I, I was born in Hong Kong, raised in Hong Kong, always passionate in um, high density environment as it is in Hong Kong as a compact city model and uh, always uh, call the sustainable um, model for all the cities around the world to, um, to study and analyze. And I, um, of course, um, given a passion in arts and design since I was a kid and also inspired by my father, also an architect and academic, I, I decided to pursue um, architecture uh, and humanities at urban, um, and the uh, UC Berkeley in environmental design. And after all the master at MIT, also with a focus on urban design. And um, of course, after uh, the reality kicked in in practicing um, world, one of many may not be able to find answers to certain um, inquiries about the status code, especially a troubled one like in Hong Kong. I'm constantly in search uh, of uh, appropriate and effective way to bridge the gap between research topics and uh, daily architectural practice, especially in this case, this context and, uh, of the Asian city, a uh, very extreme one, um, high density um, scenario with a lot of numerous constraints uh, uh, regarding building codes and other challenges, etc. So I look into um, uh, teaching and education as a, a, a way to to pose this um, inquiries and what I've learned from the uh, MIT education and courses. I try to bring in what I've uh, learned um, and try to bring awareness in, in the importance of inclusive design thinking to my students, how to make our city more livable for all. 
And so um, here you can see some of the research question includes how should we address design challenges of old neighborhoods in Hong Kong, such as um, in this case in the uh, Sian Kun, um, where when technological advancement is available, such as uh, electric cars and drones, etc. How can the urban public space be reimagined according to the needs of the community and reprioritize to the livability of our high dense city? So ideally, this kind of uh, research investigation would benefit and be enriched by specificity of location and context. However, there also, would also be potential prototypical application to other metropolitan contexts. And how can we reimagine public rooms and high dense cities such as Hong Kong in a smart way? So I see um, part of the design process is to listen from various perspectives, like I will bring uh, practitioners and um, researchers together at this uh, numerous uh, forums and discussion tours um, to, to the actual practice, practice firms, local firms and also publicize um, a, a lot of um, self-funded publication online and offline um, for of the student collective works. And regarding my um, practice, uh, urban design practice, I try to um, test and make it work through different attempts um, um, revolving around um, some recent work uh, focused on contributing to the society in a positive manner, such as the providing transitional social housing for uh, temporary urban sites um, by making good architecture and public space to enrich livability and sustainability for local communities. I work with um, local NGOs, communities, and other disciplines, such as uh, building technologies um, with con um, modular integrated um, containers uh, construction um, to solve social challenges together. So during this kind of co-creation process, we are supporting communities to participate meaningfully in designing and determining solutions around critical service, including housing, and transportations. Um, and we usually go through a series of public engagement interviews and roundtable discussion with community leaders. This is to make um, governments, corporations, and other institutes more accountable, transparent, and responsive to citizen feedback, and to create an or advance uh, equitable and inclusive economic growth across uh, geographic geographies and demographics, um, and also as well as to increase civic participation and inclusion, open up the discussion um, platform to different levels of communities, encourage um, social engagement to ensure all citizens can overcome barriers to uh, civic participations and inclusion, including expanding access uh, to information, et cetera. So this series of work and experience actually brought me into a very special opportunity. Um, in 2019, I joined MIT Hong Kong Innovation Node to work on the research uh, regarding a uh, smart city initiative based in the district called Kowloon East, which is the up and um, rising CBD2 to be. Um, and this um, area has played uh, important roles throughout the city development um, during different times. And now there's a set of social economic challenges faced by the underprivileged individual during this urban regeneration process. And um, so through a custom design participation, uh, participatory template, the year long, year long engagement process prompts diversified stakeholders to sit and work together. And in this case, uh, counties of Hong Kong, 
we hope to lead to a human-oriented, methodologically driven template that is sound, workable, and most importantly, transferable for all other districts or city within and beyond that of Hong Kong. And, um, and our goal is to see how we can better drive a collaboration among public, private, and nonprofit organization to support equal, uh, equitable workforce and small business development efforts while promoting innovative solutions and bring an inclusive growth and improve social mobility to its local residents. And um, just a quick overview of other pillars that um, explain the works of um, MIT Hong Kong Innovation Node, as its name suggests, the Innovation Node also connects and educates uh, by leveraging MIT and galvanizing Hong Kong and GBA innovation e ecosystem. So the uh, MIT Node uh, brings together um, MIT professors and also MIT alumni um, to together to bring in um, diverse um, uh, program such as uh, smart city, FinTech and health tech, uh, et cetera. And we try to build um, through uh, our entrepreneurship education and smart city programs um, with a 14 uh, residential boot camps that draw multidisciplines and start up uh, from university, industry and government that working on local challenge and uh, with a prototypes in the uh, presented in the end of the, this very intensive workshop based in Hong Kong. And other, um, other workshops that we hold uh, recently due to the COVID uh, pandemic, we also invited uh, MIT alumni such as Dr. Joseph Wu from Hong Kong School of Public Health to share about data analytics and how to contain the pandemic through their current research work and lab. And um, not last but not least, we welcome very much all MIT alum um, uh, globally and uh, locally as well to participate in our event um, digitally. Um, uh, of course, the physical presence will be very welcome, uh, but hope you can join us all um, in the near future. So thank you, stay tuned and uh, welcome to connect and all Back to Pam, thank you. Thank you all, those were phenomenal presentations. I'm going to be thinking about your uh, work for a long, long time. We have a number of questions in the Q&A and not a lot of time. So let me just, um, open it up for everyone. The first question is, how much influence do each of you feel your initial jobs after graduation had on what you do now? And how critical, in other words, is that very first job? Any of you, please just jump in. I'm not going to call on people. <laughs> sure, I can, I can just say something very briefly. Um, for me, I, I took many jobs uh, at the beginning, you know, academia. Uh, my NGO trying to set it up, um, remodeling bathrooms for friends, solving, you know, solving their problems. And I think uh, sometimes we just don't talk about all the little things we do, even consultancy for development banking and urbanism. But I think doing all sorts of different things kind of told me, you know, where is it that I wanted to follow? And I think, um, you know, MIT's idea of learning by doing is what you should try. Just try out what works. Um, and see and, and try things and then you'll know. Yeah, I would, I would build on what Anna just said and say that don't let, um, uh, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. There's no perfect first job that's going to launch you. You're going to learn and iterate and just do as much as you can. Try as many different things because then you'll get a sense for what you're most passionate about, which will end up being a really fruitful track. And like I said in my presentation, it's all edits and posts. You can build your narrative to your future employer for what skills you learned along the way in any way you want. It's just about trying things and discovering and, and not worrying too much about it right when you graduate. That sounds like great advice. I'm gonna move to the next question so we can hear from someone else. Um, 
Paul Menard says, please comment on the following axiom, and I am quoting, for most projects, all the important decisions have already been made before an architect even becomes involved. He says he's particularly interested in knowing how this relates to solving current affordable housing crisis problems. Um, there are certainly, there's no lack of other problems that it could apply to. Any one of you want to jump in? Has it all been solved before they reach you? Well, I'll jump in. I'm not sure if I can speak to the affordable housing exactly, but uh, in particular, I think one of the things that I really have, I mean, I push for my own students and, and for my practice is that, you know, you can go work for somebody else, but you can also do your own thing. And whether you do your own thing, you can have clients that may dictate things, especially if they're developers and stuff like that. But, you know, I think some of the, some of what you learn in school is about, you know, kind of like finding ways to take back ownership of some of the process. And so if you think of digital fabrication at MIT, that's kind of taking back design build. If you think of development, that's taking back plants. If you think of, you know, countless other ways, it, it's about empowering you to own more of that project. But I also think that you can create projects. And one of the stuff that I was showing about embedding ourselves with organizations, and I'm sure that you know, obviously this really relates to the others as well, um, is, is us saying, you know, the projects that are out there are not always the right projects and they do have um, strings attached and the decisions are made, the scope is set. So go create your own project, go figure out what you want to do and embed yourself with somebody that is doing it. And um, it might take a long time, but those are the most meaningful things, I think. I see Pam, which probably means we're very close to the end of our time. Um, are there any closing thoughts from maybe just a couple of sentences from each one of you that you want to leave as parting words to our alumni and our students? Uh, well, I would just like to share something that a professor at MIT told me and I think was very important for my path and I hope it guides them too. Uh, on our first urban design class, he made us do a timeline of architecture and urban design history. And uh, when we reached 2012, the year back then, he said, what's gonna happen in the next 40 years in urban design history, how the world is gonna change? And, and we were like, we don't know. And he said, well, it's your professional timeline. It's, it's where you're gonna be. The next 40 years so um, you have the opportunity while you're at MIT to think about what is coming in the next 40 years and how you're going to make the best of it and then also the other day I made an eight met, uh, met an 80 year old entrepreneur who a Peruvian entrepreneur who's been through all the dictatorship in Peru and many things and I asked him he's a rower and I asked him what is the hardest part of a rowing competition and he said the first 500 meters because you think you can't do it and then you actually end up doing two kilometers and it's like that's the quarter of the career so out of those 40 years that my professor michael dennis mentioned well we are all in those first 10 years so we are rowing hard and we're not sure if we're gonna make it i think uh with COVID today you know yesterday it's something else next year it's gonna be something else there's always gonna be something but this 10 years are, are really important. It's a quarter of our career. And, and if you're listening and you're at MIT now, enjoy that time to think about the next 40 years and how much the world is going to change and how you're going to make an impact on that or not. Thank you. That's great. I, I would say also maybe that, um, you know, to kind of uh, underscore the diversity of the, the paths that we take, which are pretty indicative of other um, our fellow alums that are not not here but are all doing amazing things also um you know it's i thought it was the design skills that were um maybe when i started that were the most important things it's not at all you know it's really the the leadership and probably the vision and seeing the larger systems and you know putting together teams and just figuring out how to do stuff um that's way more important and i think you know the idea of entrepreneurship um has become something i think is, is something that is, is enormously empowering. Um, and so when we're doing the community stuff, I think it's, you know, we want entrepreneurship through our own office, but we're trying to pass on not just spaces and projects, but we're trying to pass on those skills that that is part of the outcome. And I think that 
whether you're MIT or anywhere else, but especially MIT, you have those skills. Like you, I mean, any alum from any, any year has those incredible skills that are really, really, really valuable. Three-dimensional thinking, you know, uh, you know, playing pickup basketball, as, as some would say about, you know, just not knowing necessarily a, a path, but once you get hit with something, you'll figure out how to deal with it. You know, I think that's, that's really the most valuable thing. And, you know, sometimes you, you don't realize that, but um, it just takes a project or some, some thing that you do that you love and people that you care about, you work with um, to make those things come out and shine. Yeah, I um, will agree with that, uh, what Matt and Anna has uh, suggested. We all have um, a very diverse um, background and also uh, the education in, at MIT is uh, very diverse as well. I appreciate very much that we have the flexibility and perhaps not enough time to explore all this um, different great works that individual labs and researcher was um, doing at school. So I would say that take all the time, don't just stuck your head inside the studio, but go around uh, the corridors and explore all this uh, very frontier work um, um, of all different disciplinary um, disciplines are working at. Um, now, um, with this all influxed situation around the globe, I don't think we know where the future will be. And there's a lot of uncertainty about work for the future or work of the future. So I think we should all equip as much as possible our critical mind and skill set um, while we're still at school with the great capacity that the school and body of research that uh, the school has and pioneer. I can't imagine any, adding anything more poetic than what's already been said. So I'll just say plus one to everything that's been shared. And when I was putting together this presentation, I was very, it was very easy for me to remember how scared I felt when I was first starting out of feeling like these were big decisions and only seven years now um, it's it goes by so fast and it should feel messy um, and there's so much opportunity and you have incredible privilege being a part of the MIT community there's so many opportunities no matter which direction you choose to go um, and so I just hope for everyone that's maybe listening that you have a, a peace of mind that it's all fine that I felt worried and it's all fine um, as Matt mentioned, all of our classmates are doing really wonderful things. Um, and so you can't go wrong and you're part of an incredible community. There is no better way to end our session than that. Let me give Pam the last word um, and let me leave all of you with my sincere thanks for your contribution and for the inspiration that you're giving all of us and our MIT alumni community. Pam. Thank you, Marilise. Thank you, Sunny, Matt, Catherine and Anna. Your achievements are inspirational. By showing us the range of people and communities your work engages, the reach and scale of your impact, the sensibilities you bring to your design solutions, and the thoughtfulness and resourcefulness with which you are applying your time and talents. I think you are helping us answer the question, can architects really change the world? Yes, we will invent the future together and build a better world. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Stay safe and well. Thank you, Pam. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.